coastline in the wake of the catastrophic BP oil spill. She immediately understood that a, a metamorphosis had to take place in our human values to avoid such devastation in the future. Having gained her bachelor's degree in physics from Temple University, she became an advocate for the new physics of cold fusion technology, which she saw as a viable avenue to clean energy, making oil spills a thing of the past. To help the public become aware of and create a demand for the profound potentials of cold fusion, she created a website called Cold Fusion Now. To date, she has written over 300 articles and produced videos on the science of cold fusion. In her talk today, she will speak about how humanity needs to prepare itself mentally and metaphysically to move into the paradigm of zero point energy. Please welcome Ruby Carrot. Ask her, to, oh, I was going to say, ask her to show you where she's wired. It's cute. Probably <laughs> see it. Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm just thrilled to be here with so many leaders in the new energy movement. And um, while any one of these technologies, whether it's zero point, uh, magnets, uh, any one of these technologies could have a breakthrough at any time, uh, I believe that uh, cold fusion is one of the furthest along and that may give us a usable technology uh, first. Um, the Cold Fusion Now website is a loose conglomeration of a number of individuals who use it to just post up their activism, their advocacy, and um, uh, I won't go through the whole list, but uh, I know that James Martinez is my associate, and he's going to be speaking here as well. And um, well, while I wanted to talk about the implications of this technology on our society, uh, I'm going to fit that in a little bit, but I was asked to give an overview of the cold fusion situation, uh, what it is and why we don't have it after 25 years. So that's what I'm going to try to, uh, oops, sorry. Um, at coldfusionnow.org, uh, we've collected our advocacy and our acti activism, uh, documenting all the activities that people have done uh, <clears throat> that are associated with us. Um, we started out uh, posting audio of James Martinez's interviews with cold fusion scientists. Uh, the first on the radio that we know of um, for the general public. And uh, a blog where I started writing articles in support of cold fusion. We did educational outreach events and art actions in the streets. We collected uh, names and signatures uh, at this uh, event here. If I get this right. Uh, this was a, a math festival, because I teach math part time. Uh, and uh, I had the kids making marshmallow nuclei something I got from a hot fusion website. Thank you, Lawrence Livermore. Uh, but uh, of course, they were making light hydrogen and deuterium so, and making helium. So, uh, And uh, we've sent a lot of letters, uh, mailings to the legislative bodies, the Senate, the Congress, the Office of Science and Technology, the president, our local officials. Uh, we've uh, done a numerous mailings. We do uh, art events with, uh, we, we made some stickers and t-shirts. Uh, this is Craig Baldwin, uh, independent filmmaker in San Francisco with one of our early stickers. And this is Miami DJ, DJ Lispam. And he's, he has our stickers all over his gear when he gigs all over Miami. And where's our t-shirts? Uh, we also believe, as many of you here do, and I'm so glad to hear it, 
that art is so important to advocacy and education. Uh, last year we had a, a New Energy Paradigm art show and uh, this was our first prize winner, for Adrian Grecu from Romania and he did this uh, piece of art right here. <clears throat> While I uh, have actually stopped blogging at this point, our activism has uh, gone to another level. We've done a lot of video interviews and we're making a lot of films now. Uh, we were at the ICCF 18, the International Conference on Cold Fusion that was held at the University of Miami this past July. Uh, nobody was there to videotape it. Nobody. And so me and uh, my associate e Eli Elliott ended up videotaping the whole entire thing and Eli is right now editing the five, six days of video that we got and we're posting those lectures online at coldfusionnow.org. So you can hear the latest of what the scientists are uh, up to in that situation. Uh, we're also uh, working on a new feature documentary on the field. Um, there hasn't been a real documentary on the field of cold fusion that shows the positive developments uh, for a long time, since maybe fire from water. Uh, so we really need to uh, get something that, that reveals the successes. And uh, we're going to begin filming uh, next spring with, for that um, project. One of our biggest advocacy tools has been the history of cold fusion calendar. And uh, I have a couple of the 2013s available at the desk uh, for free that you can um, pick up. And um, we've got the 2014 just debuting this weekend. Uh, and in this case, um, this calendar, I think uh, Sterling Allen told me last year that uh, there's not enough room to write all my appointments. And that's because uh, all the days are filled with little bits of cold fusion history, uh, facts and figures and formulas, and a lot of fun. And um, we've got pictures from some of the leading researchers in the field and their cells. And last year's um, <clears throat> theme was the early years. And the data in the calendar was based on Eugene Malov's timeline uh, published in Infinite Energy magazine uh, on the 10th anniversary issue in 1999. And uh, this year's theme is uh, a 21st century education, highlighting some of the educational institutions uh, and schools that have faculty doing cold fusion research with students. And in fact, we've got some great photos, uh, including the students, uh, the students' cells running at the Pirelli High School in Rome, where the high school students are doing uh, cold fusion experiments. Uh, and it's just a really fantastic um, project that they're doing. Um, I should say that the historical record here is incomplete. It's only the material that I've gathered from Eugene Malov's timeline and what I gather myself in addition to that. Uh, I am collecting all of this data in a big spreadsheet and we hope to at one point do a interactive digital timeline that will have all of the, the people that have worked and their achievements and we won't forget anybody because everybody deserves to be recognized who's contributed to this field. So while the calendar is incomplete uh, and each year we're, we're adding new things and you know shifting and swapping out, uh, we are collecting all the data that's in these calendars and all the data that I collect in a big spreadsheet to put it all together at some point. <clears throat>
<clears throat> you'll have to excuse me, I'm just getting over a head cold here. And um, my voice is a little messed up. <clears throat> um, so what is cold fusion? How did it start? And why would someone like myself interrupt their life to f all full in advocate for it? Well, it's, um, some of you know, it's a form of energy that is non-polluting, uh, off-grid, uh, and it is energy dense and allows human beings, uh, well, the potential is to allow human beings a technological green future. Uh, we know that we could have a technological future for a little while, but all our systems are in crisis. If we want a technological future, we need an energy-dense power source to do it. I believe cold fusion is a contender to be first as a usable technology. It was announced in 1989, March 23, 1989. It was one data bit that went into a stream of a new communication system. The confluence of the TV, radio, satellite, and digital technologies that now has fully matured, encasing our planet. And this is a picture of the satellites in orbit around our planet right now. Uh, that news data point was just one small input that through this, what Bob Dobbs calls the Android meme, this confluence of analog uh, TV, radio, and satellite digital into this Android meme. And it was amplified to such great output at the speed of light, and it shook the planet. Um, what this really was, and here it's maybe difficult to see, I'm going to show another picture later, it, it was a simple uh, cell and it has two electrodes, a negatively charged cathode and a positively charged anode uh, submerged in a beaker or a test tube of heavy water and connected to a small battery. Uh, scientists emerged from their basement lab after five years of research to announce a discovery made with this simple cell and it entered through fax machines and satellites. Uh, the news media took over uh, the story and their words, their images were uh, sliced and diced for prime time. It was uh, a confusing time. The message was diluted through all this different media. And I love this little graphic here. This is for actually from an early Westinghouse photo. And you see the, uh, the, the tower here sending out some electromagnetic waves and through a screen and this kid just going crazy. And I, I it's, I, I, I wonder why did Westinghouse put this in their uh, pamphlet, but when you understand the effects of the Android meme, this confluence of um, technology, uh, you can see why it threatens identities. Science developed over 2,500 years in a step-by-step -step process, sometimes forward, sometimes back, but always incremental uh, at human speed, peer-reviewed, hierarchical. The digital technology that we saw emerging uh, in 1989 went completely around that. And uh, I agree that there is no conspiracy when we look at the suppression of these breakthrough technologies. It really is paradigms and the, uh, this particular uh, situation with cold fusion 
uh, arrived when this technology had threatened all the ed institutions, or the educational st institutions, political, and um, this data point being amplified into so much more. Uh, like if, if you take a digital photo and you post it online, it, it amplifies it into an infinite number of channels. Well, cold fusion, as my good friend and media ecologist Bob Dobbs says, is the hardware equivalent to the Android meme. Cold fusion takes a little bit of battery input and then transforms that little input into a larger, significantly larger energy output. That allow, that's the hardware equivalent that will allow human beings to catch up with this digital environment. I know uh, I just had to stop blogging because I just can't keep up anymore. And uh, I really need this cold ba fusion battery to help me keep up. So, um, so what was it that got these two scientists very excited? Uh, the scientist in question, Dr. Martin Fleischman and Dr. Stanley Pons, both working out of the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, where Dr. Stanley Pons was chairman of chemistry. Dr. Martin Fleischman was one of the top electrochemists in the world at the time. And from these tiny little handheld cells that they're holding up here, uh, came this discovery that got them excited and what was in one of, one of its names called the anomalous heat effect. What is the anomalous heat effect? Well, when they hooked a battery up to these little cells uh, and started electrolyzing the solution of water in, it, in the cell, uh, it started to increase in heat. As it got hotter, the water would evaporate, and so they would fill the water back up, and that's what these little, uh, these little drops, and then they, it goes back up again, are. Um, you can see here that it takes a long time. This is at uh, thir about 34 days at this point. At some point, uh, all of a sudden, the temperature just rose up 15 degrees. And it then, at that point, it started rising exponentially. Then, all of a sudden, without warning, the temperature drops almost back down to the, the slope of the line where it, where it previously was and just keeps rising steadily again. What caused this temperature rise? What caused this temperature drop? That is the question of cold fusion. It still today is unknown. There are a number of theories but no one generally accepted theory, and uh, thus the name, the anomalous heat effect. However, when you have heat generated, and this was the kind of heat that was well beyond any chemical reaction, and the scientists speculated, well, it had to be nuclear. These people computed all of the chemical inputs and the, the rise in temperatures that they saw in multiple data runs, this is just one of their early data, uh, early data graphs that I just chose to use. Um, it's clear that this heat is much greater than anything that a chemical reaction can provide. Um, when we have that kind of heat, we can make hot water, we can make clean water, we can uh, you make steam to turn a, tur turn a turbine. This is a technology that can provide us energy once we understand what this is causing this particular anomalous heat effect. After their announcement on March 23rd, 1989, 
and the uh, news, this data bit, spread throughout the globe, scientists got very excited. They knew what this claims meant. This kind of heat coming from a small desktop cell should not be occurring. It only should occur deep inside the sun, or so they thought. Scientists around the world stopped what they were doing and became electrochemists overnight. Many of the labs you see here, uh, Texas A&M, uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, labs, these are the labs in the US, uh, all of these labs found various positive results. Some of the positive results were tritium, uh, a, which is a hydrogen isotope that only can be made by a nuclear reaction. However, the tritium was not in ratio to the neutrons. Uh, they found neutrons as well. The neutrons were of a different kind than would be expected from the conventional theory of nuclear reactions. And so this was a problem, and um, however, they are measuring neutrons, indicating a nuclear reaction. The uh, confer confirmation of nuclear-sized excess heat, uh, and also the transmutations, where one element is transformed into another element, something that should be impossible in these little desktop cells. Uh, I won't go into all of these. It was, uh, we've got the Italian universities of Siena and Bologna. Italy was really on top of this and doing a lot of great work, and they still are today. Uh, Japan uh, did a lot of work, and we see a number of universities in the US, SRI International, and this is the Baba Atomic Research Center in India all got positive results from their initial experiments in trying to reproduce what Drs. Fleischmann and Pons were uh, claiming. This is a picture from the calendar, uh, this year's calendar, of uh, Dr. Bruce Liebert and Dr. Boryan Leal from the University of Hawaii, who uh, early on had one of the highest returns of excess heat that anyone had ever seen from a variation of the, the Fleischmann pond cell using molten salts. This is a close up of an early cell uh, by uh, Akito Takahashi and his team at Osaka University. Uh, he was looking for neutrons in uh, this particular, in his experiment, and uh, he did find them. And I just, I just love the picture of this cell. It's, Awesome, I want one. Um, the excitement was so great. And um, I remember in 1989, I was in the physics department. Uh, I spent many years as a musician. And uh, I wasn't particularly gifted at physics, but I did okay. And we heard about it and we're like, what, huh, what is that? And we, it was later on, not just a month or so later, that we heard that, oh, it was a mistake. Um, but the excitement was huge back in 1989. Uh, then President Bush, the US President Bush, called in Nobel laureate Glenn Seaborg, uh, who is um, associated with uh, nuclear technology involving bombs. He uh, called in uh, Dr. Seaborg to get a briefing. Dr. Seaborg said in a later interview that he had to respond to the cold fusion question as a physicist and everything that he knew about nuclear theory, that it had to be a mistake, that it, it, he could not support this, uh, these claims because it flew in the face of everything that he knew about nuclear theory. He qu is quoted as saying to President Bush, uh, that you can't just go out and say this is not valid. Uh, you're going to have to create a high-level panel that will study it for six months, and they'll tell you it's not valid. And that's what he did. We got a panel together that uh, 
charged with producing a report uh, to investigate the claims. And uh, in this panel, uh, we had uh, John Huizinga here. He actually wrote the report. And in the report was included some of the positive, uh, some of the labs that got positive effects. You can see University of Utah, Texas A&M, Stanford University, no slouch there. Uh, Texas A&M, a separate group, and uh, Minnesota. They also got a listing of some of the, the groups that were not able to reproduce the effect. Uh, and you can see here MIT and Caltech among them. We also have a Naval Research Lab listed as not reproducing the effect, and Sandia, Sandia National Labs. Well, in fact, only about 15% of the people who attempted to reproduce cold fusion were, about, were able to reproduce it. The majority of attempts uh, failed. They did not see the effect. Uh, unfortunately, they weren't the right people. Uh, the right people would be MIT and Caltech, the premier science institutions in the US, the elite groups uh, that were unable to reproduce the effect. Um, here at Caltech, we had uh, Steve Coonan, uh, who at a, co a conference uh, c said that we are suffering under the delusion of Fleischmann and Pons, doctors Fleischmann and Pons, essentially that they are delusional. Steve Coonan later became uh, a BP oil executive and the undersecretary of the Department of Energy. Um, he just left a year or so, or two ago. Um, the MIT, uh, the Ronald Parker, who was head of the plas plasma fusion lab there, basically investigating hot fusion, a different form of fusion, uh, he actually, uh, I don't have the picture there, somehow that got missing. Um, he leaked a, a story to the local Boston newspaper, Boston Herald, uh, saying some not very nice things about Drs. Fleischmann and Pons, um, using the words fraudulent, uh, shock, schlock science, um, when the reporter published the story, uh, Dr. Parker denied saying those things. Uh, luckily, the reporter had an audio recording, and uh, it was later confirmed that, yes, he did say those things. Uh, at the APS meeting, May 1st, 1989, the American Physical Society meeting, a mere six weeks after the announcement of cold fusion, had a vote by hands saying cold fusion was dead. So scientists were not looking at the data, but choosing to just follow uh, their emotional response and uh, we um, were getting very negative uh, responses from the American Physical Society. Uh, Bob Park actively uh, went against if the federal government wanted to have any events that had cold fusion as a theme or, or had a cold fusion component. But, uh, Robert Park, the spokesman for the American Physical Society, worked hard to shut them down, and I think that um, there's some people in the audience or at the conference here that can attest to that. So uh, we have the premier science institutions, the American Physical Society, Nature Magazine, all saying that cold fusion is dead. Uh, thus the report, uh, said, well, we, it's, it seems like it's interesting. We might recommend some funding, uh, but um, it, it's, they didn't think it was that important. It was a negative report, and the DOE re report essentially stopped all fe uh, federal funding. The Patent Office, uh, which would follow the recommendations of the Department of Energy, 
uh, then rerouted all patent apl applications out of the channel if they had the words cold fusion on them. And this is a memo. Uh, I printed it off uh, Lenner.org. Um, from the, it, it's uh, June, in June of 1989, just a few months later, the patent office is saying, if you've got cold fusion on that patent, uh, you better reroute it this way. You know, we want it to go this way. And some scientists will say, well, that rerouting basically ended up into the trash. This had the effect of stopping private investment. Without a patent, without intellectual property, those who are spending uh, a lot of resources uh, cannot really bring this out. And they cannot get the funding uh, because the intellectual property is uh, up in question. So uh, in the US, the federal funding and the private investment essentially ended. Well, it turns out later analysis of both the MIT and Caltech data show that their designs were flawed. And there's a fabulous report that you can read written by Eugene Malov, uh, in particular about the MIT data, showing the last data presented was shifted <coughs> down. And uh, so the MIT and Caltech experiments, uh, which were the basis for the DOE 1989 report, uh, and these experiments, which showed negative results, may not have been negative. One of the reasons why uh, their, the reproduction of the experiment failed, uh, and, and there's, a, there's a lot of components that go into a successful cold fusion experiment. The, uh, this is just one particular uh, situation for one particular type of system, and in this case, it's the palladium deuterium systems. Uh, in this particular graph, which I took from Michael McCubre's presentation, What Happened to Cold Fusion, I just love this graph, and I actually annotated it myself. It did, he didn't have these annotations. Um, show that MIT and Caltech could not have achieved a positive result. It turns out in the types of systems that they were experimenting with, you need what's called a high loading ratio. You have to have the palladium stuffed with deuterium to greater than 85%. Here we have a loading of the hydrogen isotope deuterium into the electro, the cathode, the palladium cathode, up to 90%, up to 94%. Uh, and this is where you would see the excess heat. MIT Caltech did not get to those levels of loading. So therefore, it would be impossible for them to see a result. The theory that these scientists were wedded to and could not break away from was the theory of uh, nuclear reactions developed a hundred years ago, and which initially really describes hot fusion, the kind of fusion that we have in the sun. And this type of reaction um, makes deadly neutrons, high energy neutrons, trillions of them, one, almost one to one for your, your reaction. Cold fusion had no neutrons of this magnitude. Any radiation from cold fusion or nuclear products is so difficult to measure. Scientists have a hard time finding it. So it does make some nuclear products, but they are so few that um, this is why the scientists said, well, then it's, it's impossible that a, a nuclear reaction could be happening. And there's many other reasons why uh, this was unacceptable. And it turns out that the Naval Research Lab, Dr. Miles at the Naval Research Lab, actually did get positive results. He was listed in the DOE negative column. But it took him a while. It took him several months. In fact, it wasn't until September 
that he got results. After working from March to September, he finally got results. He called up the DOE and said, hey, I, it happened, I got it. They said, oh, sorry, too late. We're, we, we were already putting it in the report. And they published the report in November. Um, a second report was not much different than the, uh, the first report. 2004 had scientists in the panel more sympathetic, but no funding has been forthcoming since that report. Uh, however, the Department of Defense uh, has recommended that this uh, science be looked at. They believe that there's, uh, they want to see this happen. Here's a 2007 report and a 2009 report, both wanting this to be looked at. NASA's the one that's been uh, going ahead with this. From their first experiment in 1989 through the decades, right now, uh, in particular, the NASA Langley is really behind this. All of the agencies that I've talked about uh, the Navy, starting with Melvin Miles, has done 25 years of research. All of those agencies, the support is uneven. And um, you have uh, certain levels of management that are not supportive. Uh, scientists uh, that are actually doing the work that are supportive. So while NASA Langley is supportive of this, uh, not all of NASA is. Um, they're working with uh, the, well, the Air Force Research Laboratory, uh, Boeing Research Technology, both have Lenner in their plans for future green technology. And I'm just going to go quickly here. Uh, commercial efforts, which uh, my, my friend Dave Niebauer is going to talk about next, uh, are stalled. We have two different types of systems, the PD, the palladium deuterium systems that can go for a long time, but don't have the power output. They have a very small power output. And we also have uh, demonstrations of nickel hydrogen, light hydrogen systems that have high power output, and, um, but have only been demonstrated for shorter periods. So all of these labs, that are racing for a commercial product uh, each have a different model that they're following. And uh, we really need to find a theory to make this happen. The problem is there is no theory. And uh, that's why uh, we call it the Rumpelstiltskin reaction. Uh, it's guess my name. It's had multiple names through the uh, years and uh, it's also called low energy nuclear reactions. Lenner is a popular one today. Um, I won't go through the types of systems. Uh, there is growing political support. Uh, this was the European Parliament that met in June at calling cold fusion scientists uh, to present findings and they're mulling about what they should do about it. Uh, we have uh, Italian parliamentarians lobbying the Italian parliament for it. And recently, Bob Dole mentioned cold fusion as a solution in his uh, Google talk. Um, see, the funding is uneven, but uh, we have the University of Miami opening up a new nuclear uh, research center, the Sidney Kimmel Institute of Nuclear Research. And uh, do we have a Skype connection to do? Let's see. All right, we're trying to get a Skype connection here. Uh, let's see. Oh, here we go. Oops. 
Hi. 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 <laughs> okay, I think we've got you on here. Yes. Um, I wanted to talk about the, uh, the groups that were doing research. And uh, we talked about the University of Missouri, where they have the new Skinner Institute there. And that's probably the premier uh, public face of cold fusion in the US today in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, the other really exciting thing happening is the global participation of disparate groups now using the internet to communicate together and collaborate uh, on research. And uh, I want to introduce to you Bob Greenier, who is the co-founder of the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Uh, Martin Fleischmann, who passed away last year, uh, now has his legacy moving on with a group that has labs currently in France and in the US, and you're in India right now. Um, and this is Bob Greenier, a co-founder of this project. So I would like, uh, Bob, can you tell us a little bit about what the Martin Fleischmann project is and uh, what, what is it you're doing? Well, um, first of all, I'll start by saying that thank you very much for uh, having me with you. And uh, I, I pass on uh, my commiserations to the suffering of the people of Boulder um, in the recent floods there. Uh, sometimes these things are quoted as 100 year events, but I think we've had 300 year flooding events in the last 10 years in the UK. Um, so something's going on with this, the uh, ecosystem we live in, and I think. Uh, anyone who's thinking about breakthrough energy um, uh, is really doing the uh, future generations a service, uh, in my opinion. So, okay, so on, on to the subject in hand. Um, what is the MFMP? Well, basically, we were set up um, uh, on, on an inspiration at the ICCF 17, um, basically to try and uh, address uh, uh, the fact that there isn't really um, something that's replicatable that people can buy off the shelf or, or, or um, uh, get access to that will dem demonstrate this effect. And uh, it's a question that's asked all the time. Um, you know, you, you say this is happening, well, can I see it working? Can I test it? Um, <clears throat> so essentially, uh, we were set up to uh, demonstrate that there's a new primary energy source. Um, uh, a lot of people refer to it by many different names. We like to use the term uh, new fire because it's accessible to um, the public at large. Uh, whilst we can get excited about um, things uh, on the quantum level and convince matter nuclear science and so forth, um, the general public needs something they can easily uh, uh, latch onto. And essentially what, what this technology is aiming to do is to uh, do the job of the old fire and uh, why not call it the new fire? So um, the second, uh, after we uh, hopefully got to a point uh, where we can uh, demonstrate um, incontrovertibly uh, that this exists, uh, then we would like to uh, promote it and, and provide education and, and, and get to a point where we could support um, people working in the industry in, in some way or other. So essentially, those uh, three um, goals have been on our website since basically day one. And um, even before we knew how we would do it, um, we decided to operate in uh, a, a very non-destructible way, which was to have uh, uh, people that weren't necessarily bound um, in the normal ways into their science careers or so forth. Um, uh, did, so that they didn't have a risk of losing their jobs or whatever, or being uh, <laughs> rubbished or, or for fear of their income or whatever. And also that it would be distributed in multiple countries uh, and that it would be live and the data sets would be live on the internet such that you know, we're not cherry picking data, we're just showing you know, as it comes out of the systems. So we envisaged this whole process and uh, we just needed something to test and uh, um, 
and very courageous uh, researcher in the field, which you're probably aware of or not, uh, depending on where you're coming from, uh, called Francesco Cellani, uh, who is demonstrating ICCF-17. Um, uh, gave us an opportunity when we asked him to test his wires. And uh, so we went about forming a structure that would respect his uh, intellectual property and uh, his investors, but would be able to be um, open uh, with what we're doing. So essentially, we, we publish the, the plans of our reactors, the protocols uh, of our experiments, and at every single stage, uh, right through the data, uh, live data uh, delivery, we're asking anyone who's anyone to step in and say, you know, what's, what's right, what's wrong, are we seeing something we think we're seeing, are, you know, what are the conventional explanations for this, uh, is there any reality here? This is live open science, it's open source, and you can see it on quantumheat.org. Yes, that's right, Ruby. Um, so, uh, you were talking about the University of Missouri. Um, I've just spent the last two days at Amrita University um, uh, here in Kerala. They have three um, uh, university uh, campuses um, in southern India, and they're the sixth uh, uh, biggest research uh, at university in India. And we're, we're hoping that they will um, be another uh, outpost of the MFMP sooner rather than later. Um, uh, what I learned uh, from going to um, the University of Missouri for ICCF 18 was the way uh, that a relatively small um, a donation, but very significant in this field, um, has been able to leverage uh, uh, large resources that are just unimaginable for most researchers in this field. Um, the type of uh, you know measurement equipment, uh, this type of material science uh, uh, production tools. Um, all these things are just unavailable to many of the researchers that toil away um, uh, and spend their own money, frankly, uh, over the last uh, quarter of a century. Um, and so if, if that kind of model can be um, promoted, um, then uh, you know, the research in this field could really accelerate. So that's kind of what we're trying to achieve. People say, well, why aren't you trying to create huge amounts of heat and this, that, and the other? Uh, there are kind of like uh, risks with creating, trying to create things that produce immense amounts of energy, and it, you don't know what, what else might be coming out of there. It is, it is science at the cutting edge. Um, nanoscale science and micrometric scale science, um, elements and compounds do not act in the same way that bulk materials do. So we're finding all kinds of things that these materials that can do. And uh, John Pendry, who uh, was a contemporary of um, Martin Fleischmann at, at, at London Imperial College, um, he's kind of one of the uh, forefathers, as it were, of um, uh, this field in metamaterials. And you might have heard about the invisibility cloak and so forth. Um, you know, these things we just never imagined that, that the same atoms that can do everyday mundane things can be made to play in very weird ways. Um, when they get into certain structures. Um, so if we can create um, a reactor that produces uh, reliably 5 to 15 watts per gram of active material, um, and, uh, it, it, and it can do that, and, and all the questions are answered, and we can get those into universities to get, we call it jumping the hurdle, to get them over that mental barrier that this does not exist. Um, and uh, if you get them to own that hurdle, then they go, this is something we can invest into. Uh, we should be investing into it. And the excitement I got from the dean of the university and the head of material science at Amrita University here uh, yesterday uh, was powerful. So, um, you know, th there is a need for researching in this. Um, uh, <laughs> MFMP, it's impervious to the normal failure modes, um, as we're saying <laughs> earlier, other than funding. <laughs> we still need funding. Well, I, wanted to, I want you to talk about how is the FM, MFMP funded? Uh, well, essentially, it's, it's from donations and uh, the, the uh, generosity of uh, Paul Hunt, who um, is an electrical engineer, and he designed a, 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 a little thing, um, <laughs> which he sold for a lot of money, and, uh, and he's been very generous to provide uh, resources. 
Um, the, myself and some of the other external teams essentially either put our own money in or uh, vast quantities of our own time. Um, we believe this is, we, this is worthwhile. And uh, whilst we did expect that we could have achieved our primary goal within a few months, uh, we, we do realize that we were kidding ourselves. And uh, what we have demonstrated, and there's a number of things we've demonstrated, I know, I know you want to talk about that, Ruby. A number of the things that we've demonstrated uh, is that, yes, uh, things that Cellani, Francesco Cellani was claiming, uh, we've been able to replicate them. Uh, we've also been able to replicate some of the questions, and we're dealing with the questions one by one. We are getting closer to an incontrovertible experiment. And uh, right now, um, the biggest outstanding question is that of Langmuir effect, where the wire apparently catalytically de uh, uh, disassociates H2 into monoatomic hydrogen. Everyone knows that, I, I don't know how technical are the people in the room, are they interested in, in, in how this might work? <laughs> well, we just have about, uh, you know, three minutes left. Okay, so I'll, 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 I'll shut this down then quickly. So do you have a specific question you want to ask me? Well, I just want you to talk about how important has it been to have the public involved in this open source science project where people can uh, comment and uh, you've gotten funds from the public as well. How important yes. is that? Essentially, the, the, the public have been critical. Um, uh, we've received about $18,000 uh, in funds over the year. Um, and uh, we're, we're hoping that uh, an, another anonymous donor is going to give us a little bit of money to help uh, rerun the, the steel and glass cells. So that's, that's one way people can help is, is, is donations. There is a huge social multiplier. Every dollar that goes into the MFMP uh, gains the, uh, um, the time of the, uh, uh, the volunteers, but also the time of the crowd. And we are um, constantly reevaluating what we should be doing and what we are doing and, uh, by crowd contributions. They are analyzing the data, they're making suggestions. You know, they're, they're running away and looking at paper after paper. They might read a group because they pull out one paragraph that's critical to what's going on. And the beauty of live open science is that anyone, regardless of their career, can take part. Um, they can do it in their free time. Uh, and the contributions that they make, which may be the critical fork in the road to uh, you know, discovering the what way, why, and how uh, of doing this, that is recorded uh, in, in, in the record. So you, we can look back and say, at this point, this volunteer in the public somewhere said this, and this was the critical moment that, that made it all happen. So everyone gets their due credit uh, uh, for what they do. And we can work with people that want to be fully open uh, and uh, those that want to uh, protect maybe their production methods for their, their, uh, uh, their key component. So uh, um, I, we've got some really exciting things. I just have to say, you've got to watch the website in the coming days. Uh, we've had an experiment running in France. It's a differential experiment. It's been showing that it took six days to load the active wire. It's been uh, showing uh, apparent excess heat now for more than 20 days. Uh, we're going to be doing some interesting things like uh, keeping the power on uh, the, uh, uh, the active cell and increasing the, the power on the, the passive cell in order to try and establish how much more the effective output is from the active cell than, than the passive cell. And then another thing that's coming up, um, we may be able to shortcut this process. Uh, a bug in, in that experiment that, uh, has caused a, a leak of hydrogen, which we have to keep replenishing. Um, we, we're seeing something that could point to definite nuclear uh, activity. And so uh, we've been donated a, um, a, a uh, sodium uh, iodide um, gamma detector uh, tube from uh, a John Paul Guberian. And uh, we're looking to secure a, um, a gamma spectrometer uh, from um, Australia, um, such that, yeah, I mean, if we show this, it's, it's, it's open and shut case, we can start distributing the, the replication. So it's very exciting. Yes. Of course, yeah, I know it's very exciting, but it might not happen. So just <laughs> tune into the website, see what we're up to. 
Um, there's a great experiment going on in the US where they're, 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 they're testing this Langmuir uh, question. You know, that some people have criticized that the excess heat might be coming from that, although it, we fail to see how all of the excess heat can be coming from its potential. But, you know, if, 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 if the H uh, monotonic hydrogen can only travel in 70 nanometers, how is it getting to the glass uh, when we've got a uh, pressure of one bar or plus in there, you know? The, but we, we need to be absolutely thorough. If we're going to answer all these questions robustly, uh, we must do proper science. Can you tell us the name of that website where we can watch this happening? It's called uh, quantumheat.org. OK, with that, Bob, thanks for joining us. Bob Greenier from Martin Fleischmann and the World Project. And uh, I guess that's what I will close with as well, if we get that last slide there. Um, I'll just say that uh, um, very important to keep up the advocacy and get to the young people because they don't have those prejudices that uh, really smart scientists have. Uh, this is uh, a, a skater from the Venice Beach Skate Park happy to slap a sticker on uh, her board every time she flies through the air. Somebody sees that message, and that's what we want. Thanks. Bye -bye.